Hey guys, welcome to the Girl Take No Podcast. I am your host, Shani Sanders, and today we have a really good show. So parents, listen, this show is definitely for you. Today we have Laura Reardon, Reardon I'm sorry, Laura. <laughs> Laura Rildon. Um, she's a certified behavior specialist who specializes in helping parents of deeply feeling kids navigate their big emotions, such as anger and anxiety, towards more calm and peaceful conflict resolution so you can have a more peaceful home. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Sorry about the last name. Let me tell you something about me. And I tell all my guests is I will mess up a last name. Okay. <laughs> but for everybody listening, the correct spelling of her name and everything would be in the show notes. So don't even worry. <laughs> no, it, you know, it's so common and I do it too. I think the first time you say any new word, whether it's yeah. a name or otherwise, something about we, we have to stumble through it one time and then it's almost like learning by doing, you know, yes. you have to like practice saying it and then <laughs> then you get a flow of it. Just this morning, in fact, I was calling to schedule a, a follow-up doctor's appointment mm -hmm. and um, I even specifically listened on the prompt for uh -huh. press this number for this doctor. I, I listened carefully. I even kind of underlined what I was supposed to um you know, highlight when I was mm -hmm. saying the name, I still completely messed it up. I literally <laughs> to the point where I said on the message, well, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm oh my God. Okay, good. It happens to all of us. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited about this conversation because I do have questions around, um, uh, this conversation in terms of like big emotions and a lot of time you know when you say big emotions we're like oh yeah you have a bad kid but i get we don't need to label them as that right but um are you either you're being bad that type of thing so i'm excited to have this conversation one to help me change my terminology when i'm talking to the kids when i'm like you're being very bad right now like stop it and so i can really kind of get more insight on that and learn how to better parent but also i think it's just an important conversation for a lot of parents to kind of talk about because we do have a lot of parents that some that kids have anxiety and they have very they act out a lot you know and i think this um, episode is going to help them in understanding and then how to deal with it in a different way so i'm excited um before we get into that the first question i ask all my guests is give me the story behind the brand so tell me the story behind the reason why you went into like child psychology child behavior mm. well i have my own two deeply feeling kids mm. who over the years struggled with anger and anxiety and they're now grown um my daughter is um a freshman in college and my son oh. just graduated from college and he's living in his first apartment but oh. it's yeah Big yeah moves. so they get there <laughs> they, they get there yeah um but it's it's my passion to share what i know now and mm -hmm. wish i knew then for you know parents out there who are struggling so they don't have to do it alone and for kids who are feeling shamed or feeling helpless so that they get the support that they need. Yes, age. And I don't know if a lot of it has to do with the access to information, but I feel like we deal so much more with anxiety comparison because kids are have so much access to so much more. You know, I have um, nieces and children in my family um, that suffer from really bad anxiety. And I've never seen this as such, I mean, six years old. I've never seen this at such a young age to the point where they're comparing themselves to their classmates and once it like and it says something you know my niece says something to me that's very heartbreaking when she's having trouble in school and that's why i'm so glad you're here and we can talk about this is that she she felt like a little girl said something to her and it kind of ruined her whole day where we begin a lot of calls my niece and they get a lot of calls about from the teacher saying hey we're having issues with her we don't we need to figure out what to do what's the best path forward Mm -hmm. And, um, and I said to her, I said, so tell me what the problem is, because I understand that you get upset, but you still have to do the work. And what she said to me was that I get it. I can't get it out my head. Mm -hmm. I hear and I, I can't get it out my head. And I just, I just can't get it out my head. And she kept saying that. And it really bothered me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, oh my God, she's six years old. And she's already talking about how she can't seem to let go of what people say to her. And I've heard so many stories for people who have committed suicide simply because mm -hmm. of what was said to them. And they could not get this out of their head, no matter how many accomplishments they have. I know it's a lot because mm -hmm. I normally don't start the conversation this way, 
Yeah. But I, I really want to know why are we seeing so much more of that in today's children? Yeah, I, I love that you have a really specific and tangible situation that mm-hmm. we can talk about. But I think the most helpful place to start is starting with an understanding of what emotional regulation is yes. and why it's so challenging. Because that's essentially what we want for our children is the ability for them to um, be emotionally regulated. And what Mm -hmm. that means is uh, my definition of emotional regulation is the ability to be with our emotions, both those that feel comfortable and those that feel uncomfortable Mm -hmm. um, um, as they rise up in us and as they recede. And then to balance our emotions with our logic and to be able to use our logic to identify you know, solutions um, to get our needs met because essentially Mm -hmm. our emotions communicate information to us about our needs. So they're really, it's really important that we learn to be with those emotions rather than um, ignore them, dismiss them, make them go away in some fashion because they're communicating really important information to us about our needs. And so We want to learn to be with them and we want to learn how to respond to them in effective ways. And so the reason that's so challenging and the reason we often respond to them in ineffective ways, like lashing out or shutting down, is has to do with how our nervous system unconsciously affects our behavior. And Mm -hmm. so our nervous system is essentially the communication between our brain and our body, and it affects everything that we do. And when we feel okay when we feel comfortable emotions we can act in emotionally regulated ways we can work in balance with our emotions and our logic we can act as our best selves we're biologically capable of um, being calm flexible listening Mm -hmm. learning problem solving all of these things that we want to see in ourselves and in our kids but when we don't feel okay when we feel um, feelings that are uncomfortable it can trigger our fight flight or freeze response Mm. because it indicates a threat to our system to our nervous system when we experience uncomfortable sensations or feelings it triggers a threat and so um, this was um, of course a critical life-saving response for our ancestors it's how they stayed alive in a time when um, physical threats um, were numerous yeah. and, and regular. In this day and age, our fight, flight, or freeze response tends to get activated more often by our big emotions rather than physical threats. Because mm. uh, the part of our brain called the amygdala, which is in charge of triggering our fight, flight, or freeze response, doesn't know the difference between um, those uncomfortable sensations that get triggered when our life is in danger Mm -hmm. compared to when we're simply experiencing the big emotions that we do in in everyday life and so what happens is things like um you know our our toddler um doesn't get that thing they ask for in the store or our preschooler um, has a new sibling arrive in their life Mm -hmm. our older kid is maybe at school and somebody says something upsetting to them um or it's time to turn off their video game and do their homework. Um, And for us as parents, um, our kids are fighting, for example. And so all of these regular everyday life experiences um, can trigger big emotions in us, which can then lead to the activation of our fight, flight, or freeze response. And so instead of being able to act as our best selves and be with our emotions and then respond in logical ways, our automatic and unconscious reaction is to lash out or to shut down. And so kids lashing out, that can look like yelling, screaming, hitting, kicking, throwing, uh, being disrespectful, being um, mean with their words. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, For ourselves as parents, what that can look like is, um, you know, yelling, blaming, shaming, punishing, telling our kid to go away or withdrawing physically or emotionally from our kids ourselves. And so the reason that I think it's so important to begin with this foundation of understanding how our nervous system unconsciously impacts our behavior 
is because it creates that compassion,、mm-hmm. compassion for ourselves as parents when we lose it, and compassion for our kids when we don't when they don't act the way we want them to act. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's that's that's such a good point because. I first reaction, and it's so funny. I had an interview with another gentleman talking about this, and how we as parents sometimes、um, parent in fear versus compassion or love. We just go the scare tactic, like to scare you out of doing things, and so we'll yell if they're acting up in the store. I myself is guilty of this too. And if they're running too much in the house, I'm like, "Hey, stop running! Stop it! Stop it!" You know what I mean? And I'm like, "Okay, I didn't have to really yell that way that I did. You know what I mean? I could have just did a different way of talking to them." And so it is true that we, our first reaction is to kind of just like yell based off their big emotion that they're having. Then all of a sudden, I have I'm having a big emotion too, simply because I'm like, I feel like that's the only way you're gonna hear me. Why you yeah, you take that? That's a really good point, actually, because sometimes as parents, when we, you know,、um, try to、um, you know control our kids' behavior,、mm-hmm. is essentially what we're we're doing in those moments. Sometimes it's that we're losing it, and that、yeah. we we are in a state, I mean, in a reactionary state.、Um, and sometimes it we're not in a reactionary state. It's that we are taught as a culture. That the most effective way to raise good, responsible kids is to control their behavior and get them to act in the ways that we want them to act. And one、yeah. of the ways that we can do that is、um, is by yelling, by、um, trying to control their behavior with um, with um, threats of consequences or rewards.、Um, and so all of these.、Um, Strategies can be effective, and yet, what's not effective? They can be effective in the short term.、Mm-hmm. The trick is that they're not effective in the long term because when we control, when our goal is to control our kids' behavior, and we do it through yelling, blaming—I mean, excuse me—by yelling consequences or rewards, those can be effective when they're in their younger years. But as they grow older, those consequences and rewards, or that yelling, needs to get bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually they actually have no power over our child. And then、mm-hmm. where are we at? And、yeah. it's a missed opportunity. All those years to teach more effective skills, to teach skills that develop our emotional regulation. Because even if it works in the short term, basically we're raising kids who we send out into the world who don't, who who only know how to get their needs met by trying to control other people、yeah. by yelling, threatening, or bribing, as opposed to teaching them the life skills of Managing our emotions effectively,、um, being able to stay calm in 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 the midst of our big emotions, and to respond in logical ways that get our needs met. And so, it, again, it's only effective in the short term, and it's a missed opportunity to teach more effective skills. You know, you just said something that's completely blown my mind because you're so right. We learn this behavior that this is what you're supposed to do. We're supposed to yell and do this stuff in order to get them to do what we want them to do. And then, as adults, we become adults. And you're right. We yell in order to get our partners to do what we want them to do to try to control them so they can do what we want them to do to make us feel better. That is so true. I've never heard it that way before. I ever even thought about it that way before. That is that's mind blowing.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. You know that one thing right there probably would really help a lot of us in our relationships. You know, if we understand that the yelling and the screaming that we may do is just simply us trying to control this person to get them to do what we want. And you know, that made me think about my childhood and how I was raised because a lot of us parent the same way our parents do. You know, I'm a, I come from an era of I got spankings. You know, and that was a way of. Discipline and a way of saying, okay, you know what? I don't want to do that no more. But what I realized today with these kids, you can spank them, but it doesn't, like you say, it doesn't change the behavior because they're still going to end up doing it again. Do you know what I mean? It's like some kids will consistently do it over and over, no matter the consequences. And so I've been talking to a lot of my friends, and they're like, 
you know, I was in the mindset that, you know, spanking doesn't really work. It's not an effective way of discipline. It's a short, like I said, it's a short term discipline thing, but it's not really something even after it's done, you don't feel really that great about it because now your child is sad and you feel like you've hurt them. And, you know, I'm not talking about abuse, but it's just that thing of like, we're parenting the way our parents did. And we mm -hmm. felt like if it was good for me, then it's going to be good for you because my mother did like this and she got me to do what was right. And I'm on the right path in life. So I feel like this is what you need to do. But our mindset should be different. Yeah. That's exactly it. And again, it all comes back to compassion. That yeah. we can have compassion, not just for ourselves, but for our parents mm -hmm. and their parents. You know, this is generational stuff. Yeah. This is, you know, we as parents, we tend to as you said, parent the way we were parented because we don't know another way. Or mm -hmm. for some of us, we attempt to parent the exact opposite way. And either way, we're opposite, we're parenting in extremes as opposed to parenting with balance, which is typically in life, you know, yeah. where we always want to strive for is, is balance. And you also brought up another really interesting point about for our kids, you know, when we lash out at our kids, um, we, depending on their temperament, which depending on like a combination of their genetics and their life experiences, when we lash out to our kid, it's going to trigger fear in them. It's going to trigger their fight, flight, or freeze response. And so, for some of us, for some of our kids, it's going to be the fight response. Mm -hmm. They're gonna they're gonna lash out at you when 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 you punish them. Um, for some of our other kids, they're going to. Um, you know, uh, run away, uh, mm -hmm. or shut down emotionally or physically. And for some of our kids, there's another response that I didn't mention. Uh, it's called a fawn response. Hmm. And that is a response when our kid gets super cooperative. And essentially mm -hmm. what they're trying to do is appease the person that is causing them fear. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm going to be really good so that, you know, um, this person doesn't hurt me essentially. And so either way, all of the, you know, it, so again, depending on our kid's temperament, we're going to get a variety of reactions to the same punishment. Mm -hmm. But for all of our kids there, we're going to send them out to into the world, not, not knowing how to be with their emotions without doing the same thing, without lashing out or shutting down. So again, just a missed opportunity. And you know, again, it makes sense because our culture, in my opinion, um, doesn't value relationships in the same mm -hmm. way that they value um, power, wealth, um, yeah. how we look on the outside, how we yeah. act on the outside. You know, all of, all of these external um, measures of success, I think, are what we value as a culture. And so we don't, we don't value emotions. We don't value inner, um, our inner world mm -hmm. and our relationships in the same way we value all of these external things. And so we're not taught. We're not taught how to be with our emotions. We're not taught how to manage them effectively. You know, what we're taught to do is control our kids mm -hmm. so that on the outside, everything looks good Yeah, with no value for what's going on in the inside, with no value for what's happening in those relationships when the doors are closed. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Let me ask you this. What is your thoughts on, I was raised that you must have a healthy fear of your parents, you know, not to the point where you're afraid to tell them anything, but you are become afraid of consequences. And so now, because I'm just like I was raised, I do the same thing. I feel like, okay, kids, my kids need to have a healthy fear of me. I tell my nieces, your kids need to have a healthy fear of you. Is that still something we should be doing? You know what I mean? Should we still say our kids should have a healthy fear of us so that way, now that I know, now that I think about it, it's more so we can control them to do what we need them to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we can again have compassion for why, why we respond in those ways and why mm -hmm. we make, think it makes sense to respond in those ways. Um, and, and we can consider an alternative and an alternative is to, um, you know, when, when we, um, when we teach our kids to have a healthy fear of us, Mm -hmm. It's another way of saying that we teach our kids 
that they're not safe with us emotionally or physically. Mm. And when we teach our kids that they're not safe with us emotionally or physically, we're going to raise reactive kids. We're going to raise mm. kids who are not comfortable being with their emotions. Um, and so it's going to be, they're going to more quickly get triggered into that fight, flight, or freeze response. They're going to more quickly lose the ability to be with their emotions and respond in more effective ways. And so it's, it's a way to raise reactive kids. An alternative is to respond to our kids' big emotions and big behaviors in ways that teach them emotional strength rather mm. than emotional um, fragility. Because when, our, when, we, when we raise our kids to, um, well, you know, j just really, just as I said a moment ago, you know, when we raise yeah. our kids to, to that they don't feel safe, um, you know, physically or emotionally with us, we're going to raise reactive kids. So an alternative yeah. is... Um, when our kids are, um, you know, l lashing out, for example, on the outside, when we can look at that behavior through a new lens, when we can look at that behavior through the lens of what we now know, and we didn't know then, mm -hmm. we didn't even know it when my kids were young, or at least I didn't, it, you know, it's just now really beginning to be something that we talk about. It's yeah. not just now being something that we're beginning to educate parents about. I know when I went to parent education classes when my kids were young, I was taught consequences and rewards. Mm -hmm. um, it was fancy then because we called it logical consequences and somehow that made it all uh, make sense and mm -hmm. more effective than a punishment. But the truth is, is that in most cases, now a natural consequence can be a very effective thing. Yeah. And a super simple example of a natural consequence is if our kid fights us to wear a coat and, you know, of course we're not talking about a, you know, a day when they're little, you're going to freeze to death, but they're going to be uncomfortable without a coat. Mm -hmm. You know, natural consequences, we let our kid go to school with or go to the friend's house, whatever, without a coat. They learn, oh boy, that was really uncomfortable experience. I think mm -hmm. next time I'm going to wear my coat. You know, again, obviously it's a really simple ex ex example, but we can imagine how that might apply to other circumstances. But in most cases, when we say logical consequences, it's really a fancy way of saying um, punishment. Yeah. And so again, an alternative is that when we can um, teach parents about our nervous system and how it unconsciously affects our behavior, we can we can look at our children's behavior through this new lens. We can look at our child when they're acting badly mm -hmm. and understand that it's not purposeful behavior. In most cases, it is, um, it is an unconscious and automatic reaction to their big emotions that their brain is not yet biologically capable of um, responding to in more, in more effective ways because it's, um, you know, the, the when we're born, our babies are born, they come with fully developed emotions, mm -hmm. but they come with almost zero ability to manage those emotions. Yeah. And really it's not until age 25, closer to 30 for men, until the part of their brain called the prefrontal co cortex, which is responsible for managing those emotions, fully develops. And so it's something, our ability to manage those emotions develops slowly over time. And um, added to that for our deeply feeling kids or for our kids with a wide variety of other individual differences, such as, for example, sensory sensitivities, mm -hmm. ADHD, yeah. autism, um, yeah. or just simply being a deeply feeling kid, it's going to take longer to learn to manage those emotions and it's going to be harder to learn to manage their emotions, kind of like math, you know, math yeah. comes more easily for some of us compared to others. So step one, just step one of this, of a new way of parenting is simply to have that awareness. Mm -hmm. And that one little piece of information um, is something that we can hold with inside of us for a lifetime. It's mm -hmm. not something that it's not a switch. Yeah. We're not going to tomorrow, you know, become 
a different parent, but this one little piece of awareness that creates compassion for ourselves and compassion for our kids is something that we can build upon for a yeah. lifetime. You know, just yesterday, just yesterday, <laughs> my 19 year old kid, um, you know, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I lost it on her for sure. Not mm -hmm. even close in fact, yeah. but for sure, the minute I stopped talking to her, I said to myself, wow, I could have responded so much more effectively mm -hmm. if I had taken that moment to really ground myself in that awareness prior to moving into that conversation that needed to be had. So it's a lifetime of work. Yeah. I was going to ask that too. Does it, does the conversations and the dealing with those big emotions change from as they grow, you know, become like you said, now they're adults because they're still our kids. They're adults, but they're still our kids. They still have their emotions that they're dealing with. Um, and so does the way of parenting them change when it comes to their emotions? I think the way we talk to our kids um, just naturally changes over time. But mm -hmm. I think that this, as you alluded to earlier, you know, our ability to um, respond to someone in our life who's experiencing big emotions and lashing out or shutting down, um, our ability to have that awareness of where that's coming from can benefit us from, you know, the time our kids are um, preschool, toddlers, preschoolers up until, well, really until they're born, when they're born, but through, a, through our lifetime, through our relationships with our, with our partners, with our, with our coworkers, um, with our, in our friendships. Um, but in particular with our children, you know, another step that we can take building upon the awareness is that once we have that awareness um, and we can we can work on that, you know, we can work on, um, and, you know, and I, I, I teach a whole three step program about, you know, how to build emotional regulation in ourselves so that mm -hmm. we can work towards parenting in this way. But as we build upon our ability to when our kid is lashing out, be able to pause and be able to remember to switch our lens and look, look, th look at their behavior through their lens. And then when we can, um, when we can see underneath their behavior, when we can, when we can help them feel um, seen and understood by mm -hmm. recognizing that when they're acting out, they're not a bad kid. They're a good kid mm -hmm. who is learning how to respond to their emotions in more effective ways as they're building skills and their brain is developing. We help them feel physically and emotionally safe. And mm. when we respond in ways that help them feel physically and emotionally safe, they learn to correlate big emotions with safety instead of fear. And so then they become more, excuse me, they become less reactive over time, which is the building blocks for learning emo emotional regulation, for learning how to be with the, those emotions and instead of lashing out or shutting down, responding in more effective ways. Mm. Big emotions. I mean, I'm just taking this all in. Safety I'm that because... instead of fear. And so then you know, they but become it's like more, you say, it's awareness. Me, they become it's less that as parents reactive we really need to start over thinking time, about because which is the building they respond, blocks big for learning emo emotional I have, I have regulation, a son for learning how to be too. with those and so emotions his, and instead of younger, lashing out or shutting down, now, responding in more effective ways. He had very big outbursts you know what I mean and it doesn't it's matter a lot. where we I know it's so much and so <laughs> it got to the point where for me I just said you know what I'm just gonna step back I'm gonna just let him have this moment you know what I mean and I noticed that when I did that he began to calm down you know and, and I wasn't reactive um he began to just calm down because I just sat there and I watched <laughs> and I and it took everything in me to watch it not dra drape him up I'm gonna tell you that Lori it really did <laughs> it took everything in me and so, but I was like, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to feed into this because right now he needs to have this, whatever he's going through. I'm going to let him go through it and let him get it out. Mm -hmm. And then once he did that, it was almost like a light switch. He just kind of like calmed down and it's almost as if it didn't happen. And so that I learned how to, and that's what I was going to ask you about 
do we oh, deal with kids with emotions differently? So I had to learn how to deal with him differently from the other kids when it comes to how they respond. Because my first reaction was not to yell at him because I know a lot of what he's going through is based on his autism and him trying to express himself and getting frustrated yeah. and are either getting frustrated with change to do something new. And he used to get really frustrated with that because he didn't want to change. He wanted to stay the same way. And, um, and like you said, and it takes them longer. So he's much older. And then we have mm-hmm. a younger one who's, who's younger and deal with her emotion, but he was much older and still had the same type of behavior. Mm-hmm. So do you look at children? If you tell a mom who has multiple kids, cause you yourself have multiple kids, did you have to deal with their emotions differently? Or is it like, Hey, this type of training can deal with all emotions on any yeah. kid the exact same way. Well, I think that's a great question because it's, it's, it's both in some senses because yes, this is absolutely, you know, how we can consider responding to, um, all our kids in their different temperaments and personalities and challenges, because essentially our goal is going to be this, the same with all of them. We, we want all of our kids to learn how to be with their emotions and then mm-hmm. respond in effective ways. Um, such as, um, you know, communicating their needs exactly, without yeah. blaming or shaming, but instead kind of focusing on what their needs are by learning to listen with the intent of understanding, learning to resolve conflicts by identifying solutions that recognize the needs of all people. You know, these, these are all examples of ways that are effective ways to respond rather than lashing out or shutting down, which is going to escalate the conflict rather than resolve the conflict. So essentially mm-hmm. we want to learn how to, res- we want to learn how to be with conflict in effective ways. It's never about eliminating conflict because that's not possible yeah. in any relationship relations, the relationships in essence are, there's going to be conflict. So it's never, it's never our goal. You know, I talk a lot about wanting to help parents create peace in their home and by creating peace in their home, it's never about eliminating conflict. It's a, about how to be with conflict in ways that resolve it rather than escalate it mm-hmm. essentially. Um, mm-hmm. So step one is learning how to be with our emotions and step two is, you know, what to do instead essentially to, and, and that, looks different depending on whatever the particular challenge is, of course. So in that sense, these are the core skills that we can teach all of our children. Yeah. What's different is that for some of our kids, um, for some of our kids, they are just um, simply less reactive. They mm-hmm. are, um, you know, and this has a lot to do with individual differences. And this gets into something interesting because we talk about emotions, Mm -hmm. but emotions actually start as sensations in our body before Mm -hmm. they travel to our brain where we can identify words to describe that emotion. And so what happens is that because of our individual differences for some kids, what they experience with their senses, what they see, what they hear, what they touch, what they feel, what they taste. Um, for some of our kids, they're really born less reactive. So they can experience all of these sensations without it creating uncomfortable sensations that then mm. travel to the brain and, you know, get labeled as a particular emotion, for example, such as fear or anxiety or anger. Um, And for others of us, we are more sensitive. So certain things that we feel on our skin, certain things that we see with our eyes or taste, you know, all of these experiences of childhood where we're, you know, experiencing all of these new things. And so for our more sensitive kids, our more deeply feeling kids, as I call them, the experiences of life, the sensations that we experience in our day-to-day lives are just going to cause a, 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 a lot bigger feelings in us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. so when we're someone who experiences our sensations as um, bigger than other people, we're going to experience bigger emotions in response. And when we experience bigger emotions, we're going to spend more time in fight, flight, or freeze. We're going to spend more time, um, you know, um, lashing out or shutting down. And, and so it's for those kids 
who are going to need um, us to hold their hand a little longer yeah. um, as they travel the path towards emotional regulation. Um, because some of our kids are just born with the um, ability to you know, regulate their emotions with much more ease and mm -hmm. they pick it up much more quickly, which is why you'll see those beautiful YouTube videos of those, <laughs> you know, beautiful little children who are, <laughs> you know, saying to their little brother, I'm sure we've all seen these like, okay, you're upset. So let's, yeah, <laughs> those three deep breaths. And we think, oh you're my like, gosh, is that amazing? You're That's like, is that so real beautiful. life? <laughs> <laughs> and, and for some of us, it's like, see, so they can do it. So they yeah. should do it. Well, no, that kid can, can do, do it, it. at mm -hmm. that age. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, some of our kids are going to just have a much easier time of it than others. But essentially at the end of the day, as human beings, we're all going to experience um, big emotions. We're all going to experience reactivity. Mm -hmm. and we're going to all need how to um, respond in effective ways rather than ineffective ways. Yeah. You know, it's so funny you said that because I tell people all the time, I'm a reactive person. I react to what you do. <laughs> and now I'm like, I need to learn how to manage that better. That's not, you know, now that I'm having this conversation with you, it makes me think about, okay, you know what, Shine, that's not a good way to be no more. You need to learn how to be better that you can't be so reactive when someone do something because now that's just my emotions coming through. And now I feel like, oh, I got to react to this right now. You know, um, <laughs> that's so fun that I thought about that. Um, you know, today, I just feel like today's kids and I have had this conversation with a group of people before. And a lot of people go back and forth with this in terms of like, they feel like now, cause everybody's into the soft parenting, you know, everybody's learning soft parenting skills, not to be harsh with their discipline. And a lot of people are debating in terms of like, Hey, we're raising these kids to be too emotional we had to be really tough, you know, growing up. And I, and I did, I had to be tough. My mom taught me to be very tough growing up because in preparing you for the world, they made us feel, they made us understand that the world's not going to care about your emotions or how you feel. You need to be tough because you're going to have to learn how to take things. But I see now that a lot of parents are shifting from that, not, not being tough, but just like, it's okay to have those emotions. It's okay to be expressive, especially so with our young boys. You know, there are a lot of men, grown men walking around today who were taught, you don't show emotions. That's for women. You don't cry in front of nobody. That's for women. That considers you to be weak. And a lot of them are in that mindset. And a lot of them don't show emotions, which cause a lot of issues in relationships. But also a lot of them now are teaching their sons to be the same way. What are your thoughts on that? I, I, I always start with compassion and, mm -hmm. and, and assuming good intentions. So yeah. I know... Um, I know just as we love our children more than words can describe, I know par our parents loved us more than words can mm -hmm. describe. So I know our intentions are always good. And, and that makes a lot of sense, right? Of course, we want to raise kids who are emotionally strong. Mm -hmm. um, where I have a different opinion and really just based on what, how I understand, um, you know, how, how, essentially what neuroscience has taught us um, and, and our parents couldn't have known this yeah. in, in those days you know so again compassion understanding assuming good intentions but all that to say in my opinion what our parents taught us is emotional fragility mm -hmm. I don't believe that teaches emotional strength so I don't think I don't think of it as soft parenting I think of it as strength building quite mm -hmm. frankly because again if we go back to looking at things through the lens of how our nervous system impacts our behavior, we can understand that if our kids are, if our kids have the inability, so what we're basically talking about, you know, when we talk about what we thought of maybe mm -hmm. as emotional strength was really, in my opinion, shutting down. Yeah. And I'll tell yeah. you what I mean by that. It's when, again, depending on our kids' temperament, when they're raised in a home, for example, which most of us probably were, mm -hmm. in a home in where emotions were not tolerated, they were either um, dismissed, punished, uh, made to go away by giving them that thing they wanted just to make the crying stop, you know, a whole mm -hmm. range of different responses. But at the end of the day, the goal was the same to make the emotion stop, to make them go away. Yeah. You know, we can think of that as developing emotional strength. <clears throat> 
But in fact, what our kids are learning is that emotions are not safe. And so、um, I need to、uh, pretend not to have them, for example.、Um, and what、mm. that does is builds fear around emotions. And so what's going to happen is what happens a lot today, which is, for example, when our kid, maybe our kid,、um, you know,、uh, maybe when we were growing up, you know, crying wasn't allowed. Yeah. And so then our kid,、um, when our kid cries, then that's going to trigger reactivity in us because it's going to bring us right back、mm -hmm. to our growing up years when we knew that emotions weren't safe to display.、Mm -hmm. And so we know it's not safe for our kids to display their emotions. You know, again, this isn't logic, this is just these. Sub unconscious memories that、um, of、yeah. things that happened in the past that are impacting the, us in the、uh, present, and that's what a trigger is.、Yeah. And so, when our kid cries, it's going to trigger us into、um, a threat response because we know this isn't safe right now. And so, then we're going to do the same thing to our kid. We're going to lash out or shut down because we don't have the strength. To be with our child in that moment of emotion. To me, that's fragility. If、yeah. I can't handle my kid crying, I'm not emotionally strong. I'm not emotionally tough. I'm emotionally weak. Yeah, that's true. If I'm emotionally strong, I can handle being with my own difficult emotions and I can handle being with my kids' difficult emotions. That, in my opinion, is emotional strength. That is. That, that, that is true. You're right. Because a lot of times we're raised to be strong and tough, and you cannot show your emotions.、Um, you definitely don't show your emotions at work. You don't show your emotions to your, pal which are your partner as a woman. You know, you don't want to let them see you cry. You don't want to let them know you made them up. They made you upset. You have to, you have to depict、uh, an air of strength. And it's so, and you know, it's right. It's, it's met with compassion when I think about it because our parents. Didn't know anything else. All they knew is what their parents taught them. And then they in turn taught us that. And so in doing so, they believe that they were doing good to us. But you're right. It was really just telling us to shut our feelings down, to suppress them, not to show them, just suppress them. You're not supposed to be, you're not supposed to do those types of things, especially in public. You want to do them in a household? Cool, great. But outside, in certain situations, you don't do so. And I have been living my life that way, where I'm like, okay, Shawnee, you have to be strong. You can't show no emotions here. You're very upset right now, but you're going to have to wait. And you're going to have to figure it, you know what I mean? Figure it out later. You definitely cannot show this to the kids. You cannot let them see you upset. You cannot let them see you crying. You cannot let them see you hurt because you don't want them to, to show this kind of emotion. And it's doing them a real disservice. Because we should be able to feel how we feel and express it, you know, in a safe way, of course. Not saying I gotta be reactive and physical and stuff like that, but just be able to express yourself. And if you're hurt, you should be able to just cry. You should be able to cry about it. But some of us just will not do it, no matter what. I have friends who are, who are in marriage, who are married and still won't show their husband their emotions. Won't cry in front of them because they just feel like, no, it's not something I do. He's never seen me cry. And I'm yeah, one of those that, that kids. Makes where, perfect sense. Yeah, and I'm one of those that, kids where I've never seen my mom cry until I've gotten older. Yeah, you know what I mean. Until her older age. But when I was growing up, I can remember I've never seen my mom cry. I've never seen my mom hurt. I've never seen my mom. Well, I've seen her upset, but I've never seen her cry or just hurt about something. You know what、mm -hmm. I mean? And so,、yeah. I in turn become the same way, which is so. It's like you know this thing is a journey. Parenting is a journey. <laughs> <laughs> well、oh, said. It, a, a, a lifetime, a lifetime's work. It truly, <laughs> I believe, it's truly a lifetime's work as we continue to, as our relationships with our children continue to evolve. I mean, you speak of your relationship with your mother,、mm -hmm. you know, and, and I know I can, I'm thankful. My, my mom has just turned 82, and I'm thankful <sighs> to continue to have a relationship with her. It's ever, ever evolving.、Um, yeah. All of our relationships are in our. Our growth is.、Um, so, yeah, it's a journey. It's for sure is a journey that just starts with one little 
step, which is one little piece of awareness. And then, and then we, we build on that. But I think you make a good point that a lot of times, you know, when people have this, you know, association that it's not okay to show your feelings, it's because, you know, we oftentimes associate that with, um, you know, lashing out or shutting down, but it's mm -hmm. learning how to sh be with our feelings and show our feelings um, without lashing out or shutting down, which is the true gift that we can give to ourselves and ultimately give to our children. And and I don't want to forget to respond to your original question about mm -hmm. your niece, because yes. that's such a great one. And, you know, I, I I just would want to respond to that. And this kind of gets into like a whole nother topic. So we, we yeah. can't go there too deeply, but I can at least answer that question. And I can say, and because it really builds upon everything that we've mm -hmm. been talking about, yeah. which is when our kids come to us at the end of, for example, a school day, and they've had a really difficult experience, you know, it's again, our good intentioned uh, sort of automatic reaction to make those uncomfortable emotions go away because if our own mm -hmm. emotions are uncomfortable our kids emotions are a million times more uncomfortable for us because there is nothing more painful to us than our kids experiencing pain yeah. physical or emotional and so when our kid comes to us and they share something that uh creates uh, emotional discomfort in them and emotional pain in them we want to make it better i know i do is this something mm -hmm. i i really have um grown in, but it's definitely something I needed to learn is how to just um, allow my child to be with those uncomfortable emotions, you know, mm -hmm. instead of making them go away, instead of um, making it all better, making it okay, like, oh, that, you know, oh, it's fine, or oh, that didn't really happen, or oh, that's not so bad, or oh, you know, we just want to explain it away, like, this is okay, you, you know, you don't have to feel bad. Whereas if instead we can create a space for those, for that reality to exist, yeah, you know, instead of, um, oh, it's okay. It's, oh, okay. Yeah. That, that has to feel bad. That can't feel good. And when mm -hmm. we can be present with our child in their discomfort, that is literally what builds resilience. It's not uncomfortable experience that creates um trauma for example mm -hmm. it's being alone with mm -hmm. those uncomfortable feelings that we experience in difficult situations so when we can be present to our child in that space of discomfort and just simply be present with them so they're not alone in it yeah then that is the most powerful thing and then step two is once we've created that space and allowed for it, you know, we've, we've done that work of building their emotional strength, their ability to experience those uncomfortable emotions uh, without lashing out or shutting down. Um, that's, you know, that's that piece of it. That's that important work. And then mm -hmm. for our kids who um, are, for example, in this particular situation is getting stuck in negative thought patterns. Yeah. We can again, acknowledge those with compassion. That mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that you're having those thoughts. That makes a lot of sense. Again, except under, I'm feeling understood. I'm feeling accepted. I'm yes. feeling physically and safe. I'm feeling physically and emotionally safe. Therefore, I'm a bill. I'm a, have the ability to be emotionally regulated. And when I'm emotionally regulated, again, that's when we have the ability to uh, act as our best selves. To be calm flexible, open to listening, learning, and problem solving. And so when we can help our child return to a place of emotional regulation, that's when we can introduce the problem solving. And that's when we can acknowledge it makes sense for them to have those thoughts. And hmm, let's brainstorm. What are some other thoughts that we could have? Yeah. What are some, um, what's a compassionate, you could even like go through and you could do it just talking you could make a list like what would be a hmm okay so that's a thought i can make sense you'd have that thought but what's a compassionate thought that you could have and then what's a what's a more realistic thought that you could have and then you know again it's just about um allowing space for for their feelings yeah 
and having compassion for it and in returning to that emotionally, emotionally regulated space, problem solving in effective ways. So encouraging them to consider um, more calming thoughts, more effective thoughts, more mm -hmm. regulating thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think you, you, you touched on, I mean, you touched on a lot of good points, but I think one of the main things I take away from me is that one, acknowledging the feeling and letting them know that, okay, you know what? It's okay. And I understand because I think, like you said, for me, when she said it, I was more so in a mode of, okay, I got to fix this. I got to right. get her out of this space. I, I don't want her to feel this way. I don't want her to ever feel this way. I got to find a way to get her out of it versus just actually recognizing and saying that, you know what? It's okay to feel this way. I understand how you feel because I, I didn't do that. I was more so me and my niece both were more so like, she can't feel this way. There's no way I want her to feel this way. And I want I it to totally get that. It. Yeah. As a parent, it's so hard. It mm -hmm. is so hard because again, there's nothing more painful than our kids' painful feelings. Yeah. And it's just, and it was so hard to hear. And that's why I'm like, God, I just feel like today and maybe even back then, you know, we suffer from anxiety. We just didn't, it just wasn't diagnosed then. But I just felt like today it's just like so many kids who are so much younger deal with so much more emotions than I think I did as a kid you know yeah. and maybe because we recognize it now we know what it is and we can actually have the tools and people like you that can help us manage it and help kids get through it and maybe back then we just didn't like i said we didn't recognize that as in kids we just thought oh you're being a bad kid stop being a bad kid you're going to do things differently if you don't do things differently you're going to end up in i don't know you're going to end up in jail you're going to end up somewhere you know what i mean you're not going to have a good life it was more fear parenting versus um understanding how they feel and so it just, it, it's a lot to think about. And I, I'm like, I really need to start educating myself more in this particular area so I can change some of the ways that I parent because it's been embedded in me <laughs> to well, parent, yes. you know yeah. what I mean? To parent a certain way. And I'm just, this has just been a really good conversation. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've learned a lot. So I appreciate yeah. you for coming on the show. I really do. I appreciate you for having me on and for being open to, you know, thinking about things through a different perspective and, and yeah. the opportunity to share this message that, um, you know, again, I know I didn't get when I was, when my kids were young and that's why mm -hmm. I feel so um, passionate about, you know, sharing it with parents today of kids of, you know, who have kids of all ages. Yeah. Yeah. So what is one thing you want our listeners to know when it comes to your, their children, big emotions? Like what's one thing you want them to know? I guess my, my number one thing is always compassion. You mm -hmm. know, it always starts with compassion because without compassion, we're going to, we're going to be stuck in judgment, Yeah, judgment, uh, for ourselves and judgment for our kids. And I think this new way of looking at behavior is about having an understanding of how our brain and our body work and um, why it actually makes a lot of sense that it's so hard to, you know, be with our emotions without mm -hmm. lashing out or shutting down. And yet we can also recognize that it's not effective. And so we want to learn new ways. Yeah, we do. Let me ask you one more thing before we close this show out. Should as parents, should we not? Because a lot of time we we feel very, we guilt ourselves because of our kids' behavior and we put it on ourselves and we feel embarrassed and we feel ashamed. And so we feel guilty, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And that's why I think where the anger comes from are the wanted to control because we're like, oh my God, they, they're going to think that I, I raised you this way. You mm -hmm. know, should as parents, should we get out of that mindset? that type of thinking? Yeah. And it's such a complex question because for some of us that uh, like, like emotional regulation, yeah. for some of us that can come more easily than for others, because for those of us who were raised to be people pleasers, it's mm -hmm. going to be a lot harder for us to um, stop doing that than for those of us who um, are more comfortable mm -hmm. with, uh, not, you know, with setting limits, let's say, but yes, um, it's, it's always been my attitude, um, to, you know, recognize that 
again, it makes sense. Like our culture, our culture teaches us to that our the definition of being a good parent is being able to control our kids. And again, mm-hmm. the definition is about everything on the outside looking yeah. good. You know, their behavior looks good. They have on the right clothes, mm-hmm. you know, the right They're, hair. Mm-hmm. Um, and so again, compassion for why we feel the need to control our kids because literally our culture judges us by how our kids look on the outside. And yeah. yet, as parents, there's nothing, it's it's love. It's our love for our child because there's probably no bigger or more pure love in the world. And it's that love that can move us out of where we are and grow beyond that. And so when we start to understand about the importance of our internal world, um, as opposed to our external world, we can, you know, we can challenge that. We can challenge what our culture teaches us and we can make choices that value our child's and our own internal world over the external world. And I'm not saying that's going to be easy, but it is a choice. And if anything's going to empower us to make that choice, it's going to be our love for our kids. Yeah. And what, you know, want, wanting what's best for them. And as we know more, what is it? Uh, what does Oprah say? When, when we know better, we can do, do better. better. Yeah, that's true. So it's about, sh- in my opinion, it's about education. It's about sharing this knowledge. Yeah. And that's the starting, education. that's the starting place. That, that was good, Laura. I appreciate that. Um, before we end the show, I'm going to ask you one more question that I ask all my guests that come on the show. What was some of the best advice you received from another woman? Um, yes, the best advice I received <laughs> from another woman is a, a lesson that was hard for me to learn, but I can honestly say that I do believe that I'm getting better at it. And mm-hmm. that's to understand that, um, you know, uh, life is about um, getting it wrong because when we get it wrong, we learn what we need to learn to get on the path towards getting it right in the future. Mm. And I was one of those people who, you know, you know, people joke and say, oh, I don't regret anything. Well, I, I would say, and I was half joking, but half serious. (laughs) I would say, oh, I regret everything. I wish I could do my entire life over (laughs) with the knowledge that I have today. Oh yeah. Get it right. And especially when it comes to parenting, because if there's anything we want to get right, it's our parenting, because yeah. again, there's nothing we care more about than our children. And so I really have come to embrace the understanding that, you know, again, to look back on all, all my parenting years to date with compassion for yeah compassion rather regret you know i i i have the i i had the tendency to get stuck in regret you know and now now i've really moved to a place of not only compassion but empowerment yeah. like i get that life is about living mm-hmm. and if, if we were supposed to know everything and when we were born well that's how it would work and it certainly doesn't work that way life is about having experiences so we can learn yeah, yeah, that that was a really good advice. You're right. It's about those experiences and giving yourself grace. You mm-hmm. know, we we all try. It. Like I said, it's a journey. <laughs> Parenting it is, is a journey. journey. It's not really a destination. You don't get there. And be like I'm finally the greatest parent. It's a journey. It really yeah. is. And your family will never get there. Growing. We'll no. never be the. Per- it's not about being no. a perfect parent. <laughs> In fact, on my on my website, the very first thing you'll see is life. Or excuse me, parenting is not about perfection. It's about growing into our best self as we hold our child's hand. You know, or while we hold our ch- child's hand as they grow into their best self. 
Yes, and that's exactly what it is. So I appreciate you, Laura. This has been such a good conversation. I feel like I can continue talking to you, but I don't want to take up your whole day. (laughs) But this has been a really good conversation. I know so many of my listeners are going to benefit from this conversation, from watching it, from listening to it. Because as parents, you know, we're all just trying to figure it out. We all want to do better and make sure we raise well-balanced kids. You know what I mean? That can control their emotions because there's so much going on in the world today. So this was a really good conversation. And uh, listen, guys, this has been the Girl Techno Podcast. I am Shawnee Sanders, and we will see you guys next time.